I'm Adam Pascarella, and welcome to episode 43 of The Power of Bold. From New York City, it's The Power of Bold, the podcast on risk-taking, entrepreneurship, and bold living. Join us as we interview world-class performers, analyze life-changing books, and gather actionable insights to help you achieve your goals. Here's your host, Adam Pascarella. What's up, everyone? Thanks for joining me on this latest episode of The Power of Bold. As longtime listeners of the show know, I enjoy speaking with athletes, coaches, and others connected to the athletic world. Some of this is due to my intrinsic interest in sports, but I also believe that those in athletics can teach us so much about life, whether we're looking to take a large risk in our careers, or whether we're looking for tips on how to lead a team. I truly believe that sports are a microcosm of life, so I try to bring on interesting guests in athletics that can help us further understand risk-taking, career advancement, and bold living. So from this general starting point, I'm happy to present my latest guest, Mark Tressman. Mark is a football veteran, having started his football career as a quarterback for the University of Minnesota Golden Gophers and spending decades as a football coach. After attending law school, Mark became a volunteer assistant coach with the University of Miami Hurricanes. He was off to the races from there, improving his craft and taking assistant coaching positions with several college football teams and in the NFL. Mark ultimately rose to become the head coach of two teams in the Canadian Football League, where he won three great cups, which is the Canadian Football League's equivalent of the Super Bowl, and the Chicago Bears in the NFL. In our conversation, Mark and I touched on a wide range of topics, like how Mark broke into coaching, Mark's thoughts on leadership, why purpose is so important to Mark, how he thinks about bouncing back from firings and other setbacks, and his latest opportunity as the head coach and general manager of the Tampa Bay franchise in the XFL, a new football league in the United States. Now before we get started, just one more reminder about a new course that I've launched. It is called How to Podcast Without Wasting Your Time. I designed this course to help you avoid mistakes that I and others have made when starting or scaling a show. Some of the topics we discuss include the two most important words in podcasting, ensuring that there is an audience for your show, marketing your show, and how to monetize your show. To get a free preview of the course, specifically my tips on getting A-list guests for your podcast, visit thepowerofbold.com slash learning. Again, that's thepowerofbold.com slash learning. Okay, with that housekeeping behind us, here's Mark Tressman. Mark Tressman, thanks for joining me on The Power of Bold. Thanks for having me, Adam. It's good to be with you. Now, as a sports fan, and particularly as a Chicago Bears fan, I'm, I'm really excited to have you on the podcast. And there are a lot of things that I would like to discuss today, and I'd, I'd first like to start by asking you about your introduction to coaching. I find your background really interesting because you played college football as a quarterback at the University of Minnesota, but then you actually decided to go to law school. I actually went to law school as well, so I can relate there. Now, considering that, what what made you decide to go to law school, considering that you were a quarterback at a Big Ten school? And presumably, you had some interest in continuing with football. What what was it about law school that interested you? Well, I had uh, tried out uh, after I got into college with uh, as a defensive back with the Minnesota Vikings, and um, got cut. And uh, after I got cut, um, I thought football was pretty much over with, and I wanted to uh, continue um, doing something that I I would like to do, and I didn't know what that was. Um, so what everybody does when they don't have a real direction, they go to, they go to another year of school and I decided I was going to go to law school. And, um, the only school that hadn't started that I had applied to, uh, and that was in September was the university of Miami. So I got in my car and I rode down to Miami and, uh, I started law school down there. And, uh, the bottom line was, I really knew I, I, I didn't want to be in law school after a couple of weeks, but I didn't want to quit. Yeah. So I finished law school, and, and during law school, I had uh, just by the by the universe probably working in the right direction. I ran into one of the coaches and wound up being a part time uh, volunteer coach uh, in my second year at Miami. 
I was also clerking for a lawyer to try to make some extra money and uh, being a, a volunteer coach allowed me to get on the training table. So that's kind of all started. And, and uh, at the University of Miami, they were, Howard Schnellenberger was just kind of getting it going with Jim Kelly. And uh, they were starting to, you know, become a, a stronger you know, football program in the country. And then I got hired full time after taking the bar exam. And uh, we won the national championship my first year. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a great introduction to, to full time coaching. There, that's that's so interesting though. That well, well, one that you decided to go to to law school at the in the the last moment there, and then second that you had this this continuing interest with football, and you managed that with your law school course load. And like you said, you were clerking with another attorney, so presumably you were thinking of going either that direction or the football direction, and. Perhaps the football direction maybe had a bit more risk attached to it, but what was what was going through your your mind at that time? Were you thinking, oh, I need to follow this passion that I have, or was it something else? Yeah, I think for you know much of my early career, I kind of drifted in the wind, and uh, you know, I just it's kind of hard to explain. But the only school that I could wind up going to was the University of Miami. I wind up going down there. The football team is. It's beginning to grow. I'm, I'm studying for exams. I run into one of the assistants while cooking chicken. Uh, he was at the same same uh, apartment complex. We started talking. He said, you got an interesting background. You ought to talk to Coach Schnellenberger. They happened to have an opening at a volunteer assistant. I took the volunteer assistant so I could eat uh, three meals a day on the training table, which was right across the uh, quadrant from uh, the law school. And uh, I went over there every day and got involved in the football team and liked it. Uh, Coach Schellenberger felt that you know, he really probably saw something me I never saw myself and said, you can coach. You really don't want to be an agent. You really want to be a coach because he thought I went there to become an agent mm. and uh, to get to know the players. And uh, I had written about 100 handwritten letters to coaches all over the country that I wanted to coach. I got one interview. I had two lanes. I uh, didn't get the job, and uh, they changed the rules in the NCA. So four of our part-time coaches uh, had to give up their jobs because they didn't want to coach full-time. And uh, there was an opening on the staff, which Coach Nelver had promised me. It happened to be the quarterback job, and he gave it to me. And uh, I wound up uh, being a football coach, and uh, I knew nothing. Uh, I, I just uh, kind of assimilated what was going on around me, and uh, it, it worked out. Your story really reminds me of a prior guest that I've had on this show, and that was Darren Roberts. I think it was episode 27 or 28. And he took the same exact approach that you did. He graduated from Harvard Law School, or perhaps was in his third year, and he engaged in a letter writing campaign. He wrote letters to virtually every single NFL and college uh, football coach, and that's how he started with the Chiefs. And it sounds like you took a similar approach. And when you're a volunteer coach and when you're hired full time with the Miami Hurricanes, clearly there is a difference between actually playing the game as a quarterback and coaching. So how did you navigate that gap? How did you learn as quickly as possible what it takes to, to be a coach? Yeah, just to digress for a minute, um, you know, you probably know this and you probably talked about it. I, I just got done reading Darren's book, and it's really an excellent book you know, about what it's really like to try to get in the National Football League and what it's all about. He's, he, he writes it with real clarity, detail, and, and a sense of humor. It's a, it's a really fun read. Yeah, absolutely. And I've had a chance to talk with Darren. And in fact, uh, when he was trying to get a job, we, we, we chatted at the Senior Bowl back in the first year before he took a job with Herm, Herm Edwards. So, um, you know, a really good read, as, uh, as you probably talked about in a, in a previous show. Um, I really can't explain it. I just began to feel I had, I've always had an affinity for football as a kid. I used to draw plays. We used to play games with little playbooks that we had. And, you know, sometimes those kind of, um, you know, affirmations that are just not, you know, mental or emotional, you're actually doing it. It winds up manifesting itself somehow. And I, I just really think it did in football. I, I just had an affinity for the game. Uh, people would tell me you can coach. I didn't see it. Uh, but, you know, Coach Schnellenberger, who was with Bear Bryant and, you know, a, uh, you know, a great coach in his own, you know, as I said, he, he must have seen something in me to hire me to coach, you know, what I consider the most dynamic and complex position in all of sports. And, uh, you know, we were able to do well with it. I had very lucky to have two talented guys in Bernie Coaster and Vinny Testaverde. Mm. And uh, we were able to, uh, you know, manifest that into, uh, you know, a remarkable 
remarkable uh, national championship, really. Absolutely. And when, when you're working with Coach Schnellenberger and, and those quarterbacks, uh, you know, Testaverde is one I think a lot of people know of. These are these are legends in, in the game. And what, what is it about them that you notice that that really separates them from other players in, in either the NFL or in college? Or I, I guess this question yeah. also applies in your later career. Who are some of the the athletes that you've noticed that are that are really on another level? And why is that so? Well, I think that, you know, I, I hate, I've been around so many, I hate to name some and not others, but from the quarterback position, I mean, it's the most noticeable position to any, any average fan. But even as a coach, sometimes you don't realize how difficult a position is to play. The, there's not only preparation, there's not only, you know, this, this muscle structure and this ability to depth perception, to measure speed, to spin the ball. Um, and the pressure that goes on around it, it it's, it's as complex a position and dynamic a p- position, you know, handling adversity, getting hit, getting back up, all the things that are remarkable. You really have to have, you know, another, you're, you're really wired differently than most people uh, to do it. That's why they pay them so much money because so few people can do it. And, uh, and that's the fun part about coaching a quarterback position. It changes every day and it's just a remarkable um, cause you know, coaching position to have, to be able to stand back there every day and, and coach, uh, you know, a position and an athletic position that is, uh, almost impossible to play and difficult to comprehend by even the average fan. It's that, more, it's that difficult. And that any guy who plays it has got, got some of that, some of that in him. Absolutely. Is there any equivalent in day to day life uh, of being a, a quarterback? I mean, obviously, you're not walking down the street and about to get tackled by a 300 pound person. Yeah. But at yeah. least the, the stress and pressure that you feel on the field, is there any equivalent out there? I don't think there is, quite frankly. Um, um, you know, there's there's, you know, play, you know, being a singular golfer probably is the hardest job in the world in terms of athleticism you know, what they do because they're on their own basically with their caddy and with their coach maybe. But uh, I don't think there's any position in sports that exemplifies, you know, th- that's that's rare air. I mean, t- to be able to play that position at the highest level. Um, and, I, again, that's why they get paid the most money. And, uh, and, and not only do they play it, but the guys who win at a consistent level and are consistent over the years and, durable and dependable and reliable and efficient. I mean, there's not many that do that. And, uh, you know, we have certainly have some in the game. Everybody knows who they are. And if I mention three of them, I'm going to forget four and five, and I don't want to do that. Right, right. You know, if I could go back to something we were discussing just a few minutes ago, and that's navigating the transition from, you know, player to coach, or even if you think about a college quarterback going into the NFL, where you need to pick up skills as quickly as possible and you're reacting to pressure you're in an unknown environment and a lot of listeners uh, obviously aren't playing in the nfl or they're not professional athletes but do you have any advice from your experience as a player and coach for those listeners maybe who are transitioning into a different job or are starting a business they may not have all the skills that they need how can they learn and pick up those those skills as quickly as possible yeah. Well, I, I don't know if I can, I can help you there. I, I can explain the difference between player and coach, and maybe you can make the analogy to other businesses. I don't know that I can, but as a player, um, you go out and what you want to do every day and get from your coach is the skill set to be able, able to help you master your craft. That's really the number one thing. Every player at the highest level of co- playing the game wants a coach who will help him master their craft and get better and develop their skill set on a daily basis. And then there's the realization, which goes to the coach as well, that, you know, your job is interconnected to all the other jobs um, that are in a football organization. The, 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 The person who cleans the bathrooms in the locker room really is equally as vital to winning as the quarterback is in some ways, it's all connected. Everybody in a football organization is all connected. And in business, um, it is relatable because everybody is connected. And then when you move to the coaching 
side of it. It's a completely different side of it is you have to teach it, which means you have to understand the science and the skills necessary to a lot to help them do their job. So you have to become a specialist in whatever area you're in. Um, but then there's so many other things, Adam, that go into it. I think that on a daily basis, relationship building is critically critical. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I always say that I, I want to um, extend trust to everybody that I work with and I expect to earn it every day. You know, and my job as a coach is to make sure that everybody knows that they're interconnected on a daily basis. And when you know you're interconnected, you know you have to do your job. You know there has there is a sense of urgency on that particular day, on that particular play, on that particular practice to be the best I can be because if I'm not, we can't because you are us and we are you. And so that's a coach's responsibility. It's, you know, my purpose is to teach leadership, to help men grow to become better fathers, husbands, and teammates. They don't really need to know that because I have the toolbox to teach football and their focus is on the toolbox. But yet on a daily basis, my focus is to develop relationships, to share my heart with them, because I think all that leads to winning and success on a daily basis. You mentioned. And on game day. Yeah, right. You you mentioned the importance of interconnectivity and and making, you know, creating buy in not only from the players and staff, um, but the, the behind the scenes people as well. How do you tangibly do that? Is it more just you know, showing respect for everyone in the building, or is it, you know, achieving high goals and accomplishing them? How do you build this interconnected atmosphere for for those of, for those listeners, you know, in a regular job or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. I I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's because I've never really had a regular job, so I don't know if this relates, but I mean, it starts with respect and what it sounds like and what it looks like, you know, as a leader, that's where it starts basically is it's what you say and what you do is, is what people see because everybody's watching everybody and most specifically the leader. So, you know, respect and then how you handle it. I mean, um, you know, I look at, I look at the bit of football business as not being a, being sort of a uh, horizontal hierarchy, you know, where it's authentic relationships are involved with people. So you're not playing roles you know, I don't want to be the head coach and I don't want to, I don't want to talk to another coach like he's an assistant. I want us to talk on an equal level or we're just going to play the role of being the head coach and the assistant. Now, when decisions have to be made, you step into the shoes of the decision maker and you make that decision. But, uh, I, you know, as a head coach, I'm just trying to figure out a way to convert on fourth down. Sure. You know, but there's also a time to step back when you have to make the key decisions, the hard decisions you do it. But I think it starts with, respect and humility and and making sure that people see that we can't be who we are unless the people around us celebrate us and and help us and i think that's big and you know i try to make joy part of an environment because i think when you're grateful for the opportunities that you have um and you're selfless doing them you can create joy and i think that leads to winning so I don't know if that's business related or a lot, but I know that's part of the interconnectivity of a, of a diverse football locker room where people come from everywhere. And the only way you can bring value out of those people is to get to know them on a very personal level. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that can, I'm sure, be sometimes difficult when players are getting traded or, or released, um, that sort of thing. Um, you, you just mentioned humility and joy, and I think that's really interesting Uh just just because when you're doing well, there may not be as much humility as there is when you're struggling. And when you're struggling, there may not be as much joy as there would be if you're winning. So either on those highest high or lowest low of moments, how do you keep your, your team yeah. motivated and your staff uh, motivated and just to continue performing at a, at a good level? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, every, every winding road, I mean, I don't talk much about winning to our team. Maybe other coaches do. Um, we know what the vision is, but we know it's going to be a winding road. You know, that's going to have um, success along the way and adversity along the way. And, you know, adversity is a great opportunity. And that's how 
you know, I try to sell it. It's an opportunity to find out more about ourselves individually. It tests our character. It builds backbone and it creates an opportunity. And we, you know, you want to rally around whatever that opportunity is when adversity hits. And I just describe it as you, you, we're going to embrace it. We're going to take it on. We're going to do it with a smile on our face and we're going to make something better out of it. Cause you know, there's, there's a lot of different quotes in that area, but you know, as, as people say, you really don't know, you know, who you are as a, as a person until you face adversity and it's inevitable. And in football, it's very, it's inevitable on every single play every single day, because it's a zero sum game. Yeah. You know, somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose on every play and somebody wins and somebody loses on game day. So you have to, you have to learn how to respond. And those are life lessons that you really can't get anywhere else because a defensive back is going to lose in practice a percentage of the time and the receiver is going to lose a percentage of the time. And that goes to every player on the field and you got to get back up and you got 40 seconds, you got to get back to the next play and, and uh, you get your, that's handling adversity and you're going to lose, you're going to lose a couple games and can you respond? And that's adversity. And the only way to, the only way to make it turn into a positive is to embrace it, put a smile on your face and have fun with it and be confident that you can find opportunity in it. And then, you know, joy, joy is, it doesn't have to be related to winning or, or losing. Joy is, in, in my, in my definition of it, is just saying to yourself, boy, I got an opportunity here to be a part of something that very few people can be part of, and I'm going to be grateful for it, whether we win or lose. It has nothing to do with winning or losing, and I'm going to go every day, and I'm going to selflessly work to try to be the best I can be so the guy next to me can be the best he can be because I know he's got no chance unless I'm doing my job. That's mm -hmm. what joy is. It has nothing to do with game day. It has to do with how you live on a daily basis, which is the only way to live, really, moment by moment, day by day. Right, and along with that joy is just the process of perfecting your craft, and I, I'm sure that's, that's true correct. of the, the coaches and players and everyone around you. Now, this may be a little, you know, MBA-related business speak here, but, you know, if you had to characterize your leadership style, what, what would you say in response to that? Because as, as the head coach, you were a head coach for the Montreal Alouettes, uh, the Chicago Bears, like I alluded to, and the Toronto Argonauts, and you're going to be a head coach yeah. in the, the XFL as well. So you're, you're walking into a new environment when you're first appointed. You have 52 or more players looking up at you, uh, you know, trying to, to get inspired and, and they're trying to understand what you're about. What goes through your mind at that point? And how do you, how do you become essentially a leader when you're entering a new environment like that? Well, you got to do it daily. As I said, you've got to, um, you know, you got to, you got to spend time explaining the lifestyle of the team. How is, what is the locker room going to look like? And there's, you do that every day. The messaging every day is, you know, what do we, what does this locker room look like? When we drive into work, what do we want to feel? And, uh, you know, my ultimate goal, as I said, is to serve these guys and ask nothing in return. So that, that's really the bottom line of how I approach the team and my leadership style is simply to each and every moment of each and every day to create an environment that they can grow to be the best people that they can become and the best player that they can become. Um, but I don't just say it the first night. I message it every day. Mm -hmm. There is some form of message on leadership. There is some form of message on interconnectivity. It's done with a heartfelt and passionate approach with the team. And to do that, you have to be relentless. Um, I could tell you that every head coach I've worked for and, uh, and, and the coaches – uh, that are, are great coaches throughout the leagues in, in all sports. Um, they're relentless. Um, leaders are relentless. I mean, I'll stand in front of the team and I'll see a coach roll, with, roll his eyes at what I say or a player roll his eyes. But I know that there's, there's players listening and writing things down and, and taking it in. And I always tell guys, some of you get it, some of you don't, but eventually you will. But for them to eventually get it as a coach, you have to believe in your purpose and you have to be relentless. And uh, that, that's how I approach it every day. That's the way the meetings start every day. It's positive. It's passionate. But it's a very clear and succinct, uh, the leadership uh, message that I'm sending to them and the interconnectivity message that I'm sending to them. 
because you have, um, have to, on a daily basis, create a sense of urgency uh, in the locker room that people understand that this moment really matters. Mm-hmm. And it's the most important moment there ever is. But you have to do it every single moment of every single day or you don't that you can't that you won't get the buy in. So that's how I do it. So I try to do it selflessly as possible. Mhm. And on that point about being relentless, it's it's difficult, right? Because you're in the NFL you're facing 29 30 other teams and all of these coaches and staffs are putting in I'm assuming the same amount of time that you are. It's almost like law school if you're thinking of that analogy. Everyone's putting in the same amount of time to prepare for exams. The the hard work is a given at that point. How do you separate yourself from other coaches and other teams? Does this come to the idea of, you know, being creative with your play calling or or what what's really going to separate you from others as a head coach? J- considering everyone's a hard worker. Yeah, I think that um you know, it's it's it, there's so much involved. There's an infinite amount of variables with each and every team, you know, and in football, it starts with the quarterback. You know, if the quarterback's not playing at a efficient level, it's very hard to win. So, you know, every organization, they spend millions and millions and millions of dollars. But the bottom line is, if the quarterback room isn't right, and the quarterback's not performing efficiently, and the quarterback is not walking through the locker room, assimilating the locker room, and and uh, going out to practice and assimilating plays and the game plan, uh, where where there, there's a confidence that can grow around it, uh, it's it's very difficult to win. So there's the complexity is there's there's really no one thing. Hard work is a prerequisite. Um, uh, sometimes I think we can over and overestimate uh, time spent and work done. I think time management is critical. Mm. You know, in in uh, in the business and uh, you know, you asked me a little bit about how do you develop relationships. I mean, I put it on a calendar. I mean, when you're dealing with a hundred people, uh, and including a media department, uh, ticket department, community relations department, plus individual coaches who have lives and families that you want them to know that you truly are interested. I mean, you got to put it on your calendar as a businessman, as a head coach, just to make sure you make the time or it'll get away from you. Um, so I don't know that there's any one answer to, you know, what separates coaches. I, but I do think it starts with a quarterback. Yeah. And then also, I think that's really interesting, just scheduling out, um, you know, interactions or or follow-ups or checkups with some of your staff. I think that's true for all of us. It's so easy to get stuck in the day-to-day of life, and it's easy to let these relationships um, not not grow. And so scheduling that out is important. And I also liked there how you talked about time management. And as part of that, it's kind of understanding what you shouldn't be working on at, at a certain point. You obviously we all have 24 right. hours in the day and you right. need to decide right. what's, what's the most important thing I need to be working on at this point. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's a business standpoint from a business perspective. You know, I try, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's just your, your viewpoint is everybody just gets away from, from people by, by emailing and texting I don't think there's anything better than just sitting down and going face to face and saying, you know, how the kids and wife doing, you know, just reminder, if you got a, your daughter has a play next week, get out of the office, you take your computer with you, you can get your work done at home. You know, I think that, you know, letting people know if it's, if it's authentic, that you truly care about them, um, I think goes a long way in building trust and, uh, and, and building a sense of urgency with people because they don't want to, they don't want to let the team down or you down. Absolutely. Absolutely. One thing I would like to ask you about is just, just innovation and ideas in, in general. I, I think it's fair to say that you're known as an innovative coach. People have called you an offensive guru. You like to try out new ideas. And, you, you know, you're innovating and generating new ideas in a realm where there are very strict rules and I think in some respects it actually allows you to be a bit more creative because there are boundaries and you have to act within those boundaries. So when you're, you know, when you're thinking of new plays or thinking of a new offense, how do you generate those ideas within the rules at, at play? Do you look at, you know, how things have been done in different leagues? Do you look at uh, football history, that sort of thing? How, how do you think about that? I think all of it, I, you know, just as a basis, you know, that, 
when 11 are plane of 11, if you just take 11 exponentially 11 times, you can see how many variables there really are in a football field. It's, uh, you know, you could play the game for 500 years and never run all the potential plays that you're capable of running. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, innovative is a little overvalued and stated too much. I mean, I've been around the NFL for 35 years in professional football, and I see cycles, you know, where stuff that we ran back in 1985 are coming back again. So, um, you know, I think it's cyclical a little bit, and I think that, you know, whatever the hot team is, people watch that team. I think more of it's related to the quarterback play and the talent than it is to the scheme. Hmm. Um, out, of, out of respect for all the coaches, uh, I think that uh, I think there's there's an over uh, a production about you know they're they're highly creative and and uh, innovative, and I think there there's nuances. I would call them more nuances than creative. Uh, you know, create creative. Um, you know. Yeah. schematics. Yeah. I think it's more nuance and building on other things. I don't think any one person has changed football. You know, I think it's nuances off of things we see a year ago or two years ago, and then they wind up coming back. An example might be the, the bear defense. You know, the bear defense existed in 85 and it probably existed in 45. And then it came back again in the 2000s a little bit more where teams were covering the guards in the center. It's all the same. It's all schematically. It's all the same. Uh, when you're really successful at it, you know, it becomes more creative if people haven't seen it for a few years. So like I said, I think, I think the one thing coaches do is research and development is huge. Mm. People watch everything. Everybody does who's successful. They, they, they study it. They install it. They pr walk it. They practice it and they assimilate it to eventually it becomes theirs. Um, but it doesn't become theirs initially. They have to work at it for them to be really the creators of whatever that is. And they're only the creators of it if they succeed and win. So right. um, I just think creativity and, you know, innovative is a little overvalued. I really do. Because mm -hmm. everything I've, I've done over the years is things I've learned from others with some nuance along the way. Yeah, that's interesting. So I'm I'm a casual football fan. I, I tend to watch uh, the NFL seasons. I, I went to the University of Michigan, so I watch Michigan football. And as as a fan, it, it just seems like a lot of these NFL teams are are just pretty conservative. There's there's some resistance to trying out new things, e even if these new ideas are more nuanced, like you say. There's there seems to be yeah. some institutional um, bias towards just keeping things the way they are. Do you, do you agree with that? And if you experience that in your career, how did you break through those biases to, yeah. to capitalize on those nuances uh, on the field? Yeah. I, I, I don't, I just don't know if I could answer that one, Adam. Yeah. You know, I got tremendous respect for the coaches in this league and in the NFL and coaches everywhere, college football, everywhere. They, they work hard. I mean, as an offensive coach, I just want to, you know, and everybody will tell you this and who, who coaches the position and coaches often, we just want to score touchdowns. Yeah. We don't care how we get them. You can run it 50 times, throw it 50 times. It really doesn't matter, you know, but there, there is, but there's also, as again, nuances to the game where, you know, you're not just playing offense to, to win. You've got to know what's going on defensively. You've got to know who their quarterback is. There's wind, you know, all the, all the variables go into play calling as well, as you well know and uh, matchups and so forth. So, you know, I don't know that coaches are playing it safe. I, I, would, uh, I would argue, um, respectfully argue that, you know, that uh, it, it's, it's much bigger than that when you when you're put a game plan together. Sure, sure. And I defer to your, <laughs> your opinion on that. I don't have the experience, <laughs> obviously. You, you know, if I, if I could just ask you quickly here. So you've you have been let go from several teams in your coaching career. I'm I'm sure it's always an unpleasant yeah a lot of experience not a little a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. So for for those listeners, you know who who have been laid off or fired from a job or maybe not, you know as you're coaching is is the thought of of being let go or fired something that's always in the back of your mind and and if so, how do you handle that pressure and how do you compartmentalize that pressure when you're 
when you're on the field? That's a great question. I mean, I, I try to fa- stay focused on my purpose, and uh, that is to teach men how to be stronger and, and, and good leaders and good husbands, fathers, and teammates. So, um, you know, my actions and my words are very meaningful. So um, with that in mind is if they see me um, losing my edge or losing my focus, I'm not serving my purpose. And it would be very selfish for me to do that. So, um, you know, when I'm in, I'm all in, I'm focused on what I'm doing and I, I'm, I'm not in control of what happens afterwards. My job is to bring out the best in each and every person each and every day. And that's what I focus on. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I've always felt, and especially looking back at my career and back at my life, you know, I don't know that if there, how many, you know, baby boomers or 60 plus, you know, listeners you have. But I would argue that most of them would say that when they look at their life, they, they see how it was all tied together and why things happened the way they did. Um, as a result, um, you know, I haven't, I haven't really worried about it. Obviously, I, have, I had a family to feed and have a family to feed. And you want to have work, you want to have a job. But if you're really focused on serving your purpose, um, you'd be selfish and deny people what they deserve by, by looking, looking ahead and worrying about something and listening to that voice in your head that is telling you a story that may or may not happen. And and your purpose in those tough times is to be a leader, to teach your players and coaches life lessons. Is is that fair to say? Just just so Yeah, I mean that's exact that's exact that's exactly what I've been saying. So um, I'm not doing that if I'm selfishly thinking about my myself mm-hmm. um, and and, and and worrying about what's going to happen because we've lost the last five games in a row, you know, are the Bears going to fire me? That wouldn't be fair to the team, you know? So um, what's fair to the team is that I gave them every ounce of energy and focus that I could and trying to keep the team together uh, uh, as well as I could and not worry about the fallout of that particular season. That that will, will happen when it happens, but it wasn't while I was coaching the team. Sure. and. When you're facing adversity in the middle of a season, are, are there any tips or strategies that you've used to turn things around? Just just because if you look across sports, you sometimes see teams that have struggled in the first half and then something happens and they turn things around and perhaps make the playoffs at the end of a year. How do you how do you try to make that happen as a head coach? Do you, you know, switch things up, switch lineups up obviously, but at least in maybe in the motivational sense? How do you help turn things around? Well, I think that uh, first you have to ask yourself, you know, should there be change for the sake of change? You got to be able to, you know, answer that question legitimately. And, and, and then, and then secondly, um, uh, you got to look at everything you're doing and you should, you know, how you're meeting, how you're practicing. But, um, you know, I don't never like to use teams as an experiment. You know, we, there's a process that, you know, we use that we try to go through, but um, yeah, it could mean a player change. If there's players not playing up to speed, there could be a change in practice schedule just to create a little buzz in terms of how you're doing things. And um, that could go on to other things, but I, I think you have to look at everything you're doing and, and the process and, and are you getting things done that you need to get done, you know, um, and Switching things around sometimes is a good thing. I, I haven't done much of that over my career because I believe in the process and how we're working. But um, there's been times there's, you know, nuance changes again that take place with meetings or practice that, you know, create a little bit of an edge. So at, at this point, you know, your career is so fascinating. You coached in college, you coached in the NFL, the CFL, and now you're taking on this new opportunity in the XFL, uh, the Tampa franchise, which I don't believe has a name yet. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, That is correct. But what what were some of the things that you were thinking about and looking for when analyzing this particular opportunity? It's a great question. Um, uh, Oliver Luck, who's the commissioner, uh, reached out to me um, in December, late December. I'd be interested. He said he had about 75 names for head coaches. And he was just wanted to reach out to me and see if I had an interest. And I said, 
you know, it's, I'm always flattered if anybody reaches out to have an interest because it's so hard to get jobs in our business. It's a, you know, they're like diamonds Hmm. and to be a head coach in a new league was something that was, you know, something I was interested in because of the time of the year. Um, and, and how it was going to be operated. I mean, uh, Vince McMahon of the WWE has spent a tremendous amount of money, money just on Oliver alone uh, to, to uh, contract him uh, to be the commissioner. He's putting $500 million into the league, um, and he's not only doing that, but he wants to do it the right way. He wants to see real professional football. Uh, we're not trying to be the NFL by any means. So the financial commitment is there. Um, the other is is that he's given Oliver a year to put the league together, which is really unheard of that he would pay as many people as he's paying, coaches, operations, people, staff, support staff, to be able to put the league together properly and build their staffs and evaluate personnel and ramp up to the league. So one year is a lot of time. And then and Oliver is, you know, a guy of real integrity, and he's done a lot of startups. So this is something, you know, that he feels he can be build, do it with class and integrity and develop some sustainability. So all of that, plus, um, you know, after coaching the CFL, I really enjoyed that because the season was on, and then in the off season there was more time. Uh, we still had meetings and things like that, but there was just more time for family and, and have a lifestyle that was a little more conducive to the working person as opposed to uh, the NFL year, which is terribly long. And it's also off seasons that's terribly long as well. There's a lot of work to go into it, and it's a great job. Uh, but um, I just like the opportunity, and uh, I felt that you know my time and place uh, it was a good place to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And as part of this opportunity, you were also named the general manager of the Tampa franchise. And as, as far as this GM angle, what are you most excited about that? Well, I, I think it's, uh, you know, the, the vision of the GM job for me that I wouldn't have taken it if he, I wouldn't have, uh, I would have taken the job if I wasn't the GM because, mm -hmm. you know, more than anything, I like to coach the team and be a part of the offensive process as well, as well as coach the coaches and so forth. I think the GM term in this league is really overseeing the entire football operations. So I'll have a director of player personnel uh, who will be in, 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 in a, an assistant who will be involved in in the personnel side of it. We don't have to negotiate contracts. I don't have to do any of that. I don't have to deal with the agents because the agents deal with the league because all the teams are under the same salary cap and, mm. and structures. So the GM job is really uh, uh, probably uh, you know a bigger title than it doesn't really say what I'm going to be doing. It. You know, I'm going to be the head football coach and oversee all the operations of the team, uh, but I'll certainly have people in position who will be delegated responsibility for, for sites outside of the football team. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, it's sometimes tough to get fans' attention these days. Uh, there are just so many options out there, not only within football, but <laughs> just in uh, life itself with, you know, Netflix sure. and, and all these sure. other alternatives. So. Yep. What what is the XFL or your pitch uh, for fans? Why, why should they pay attention to the XFL yeah. instead of yeah. even the AAF or the NFL? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, just a couple things. I think the uh, the AAF uh, will be a, is a legitimate contender to the XFL right now, uh, as we see it. Um, you know, the WWE did a tremendous marketing study of football fans, you know, around the country, and. Uh, you know, they did a study that there's a lot of fans. And again, we're in major cities in the XFL. So we're in the, we're in the major league NFL cities. Um, as, as we all know them, Seattle, LA, Houston, Dallas, say, uh, St. Louis will have one now, uh, Tampa, Washington, DC, and New York. So we're in major cities. And what they found is that there's a tremendous appetite for football after the NFL season is over. Mm. Um, uh, the pitch for this pitch for the XFL is, I mean, the players we're going to have are going to be very similar to the CFL, which is really a very good quality of football for the American players who come North to play. So we'll, my feeling is, is that if we can find the quarterbacks, we have a chance to put a quality product on the field. Uh, camp is going to be great because a father or mother with a family of four can come to a game for a hundred bucks, pay yeah. for parking and uh, have a Coke and a hot dog 
and and not we won't be taking their mortgage payment. So if we can, my job is to put a team together that, you know, the product on the field is recognizable, can be appreciated, and can be something our team and our fans can be proud watching. And um, and the and the league is going to have two uh, a, ma- a major television deal. There'll be two major networks that'll televise it. That'll be an influx of uh, you know finances as well. And uh, between the market for fans and uh, the intent to put a quality product that the people will want to come out and watch, and there'll be no better place in Tampa. The weather's going to be the weather's going to be perfect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in from February to April, um, and and the state of Florida has a, a tremendous football. I mean, it's one of probably the top half dozen football states in America. Um, there'll be football fans there, and if we we do the right thing, um, we'll get some people out to watch it. So that's the pitch so to speak. Yeah, it's interesting. And and at least for you, you're coming full circle. You're going from uh, University of Miami as a volunteer coach back to Florida to become a head coach, so which is pretty cool. Um, Well, well, Mark, I always ask my guests one thing that listeners can do right after this episode to implement some of the lessons we discuss. And I'd like to ask you that question just to wrap up here. Is, Is there anything listeners can do right now to implement some of the lessons or insights we've talked today, whether that's, you know, deals with leadership or learning different skills, that sort of thing. Yeah. A friend of mine about 20 years ago said, uh, you know, you really should write down a mission statement, really think about in a, in a microcosm, you know, what you really want to do with your life. And I did, and I'll, I'll be happy to share it with you. Um, and it really was three statements. Um, I was going to embrace adversity along the way. And so when you think about embracing adversity, you think about every day you're going to have to face something and that's not good to you. And the only way to face it is to embrace it because it's got a hell of a chance to lead to opportunity. So that was number one. The second part of my mission statement was I was going to stay humble in success. So anytime I've had success over my career in life on or off the field, I've always stopped and taken three deep breaths and, and said, think about all the people that allowed me to get to this place where I'm lifted up and I'm out there in a, su- in a successful venture or, ha- or has any kind of success. There's always so many others around you who lifted you up. And I always try to remind myself of that so it doesn't make it about me that I couldn't have been here without others. And mm-hmm. then the last part of it, and I think it was the most important in my mission statement, is I was going to have the ongoing passion to relentlessly to relentlessly serve others, never asking or wanting anything in return or expecting anything in return. And that, to me, has led to a more fulfilling life, quite frankly, is number three. And, uh, and again, it doesn't have to be that mission statement, but it's just an example of what people can do because you really can't leave your house unless you have purpose. You know, you really have to know the why. Uh, behind, you know, what you're doing with your life. And if you can really define that and put your heart into it, it, it can take you to some places that maybe you never thought you could go. Absolutely. Well, that's that's terrific advice. I'm going to craft my own mission statement uh, <laughs> after this interview. And <laughs> and uh, I appreciate everything, Mark. I, I wish you, you know, the best of luck with your new opportunity in Tampa. And uh, good luck with the upcoming season, 2020. Thanks, Adam, for having me on today. Uh, I appreciate listening to the podcast. All right. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. Thanks again to my guest, Mark Tressman. Whether you're interested in sports or not, I hope you gathered some insights from Mark that you can use in your own career. To view show notes and a transcript of this episode, visit thepowerofbold.com. And as a reminder, you can also visit thepowerofbold.com slash learning to find my free mini course on finding A-list guests for your podcast. Finally, if you like the show, I'd greatly appreciate if you can give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Every five-star review helps potential listeners find the show, so I appreciate your support. So once again, thanks for tuning in. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Power of Bold. For show notes and a transcript of this episode, visit thepowerofbold.com. Feel free to get in touch by visiting our Facebook and Twitter pages. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Google Play. We'll see you next time. 